Hello everybody, welcome to my talk on higher order generalization of harmonic maps within the fourth geometric analysis festival. First of all, I would like to thank Hoyo Lee for organizing this great online festival, which is a very nice thing in these difficult times for all of us to still have scientific exchange. Let me give a short outline of what I want to tell you in the next 45 minutes. So first there will be an introduction, which will recall various concepts on harmonic maps and biharmonic maps, and which I will also use to fix the notation that I will use throughout this talk. In the second section, I will talk about R harmonic maps, which is the first higher order generalization of harmonic maps. And I will present two recent results obtained for these maps, which is on the one hand a structure theorem, and on the other hand, uh, I will show you various unique continuation theorems. In the third part of the talk, I will focus on a second higher order version of harmonic maps, so-called ESR harmonic maps, and present some recent results. In particular, I will show you various classes of examples of such maps. And in the end, there will be an outlook and I will present some open problems in this field of research. So let us start by recalling what are harmonic maps. In order to define harmonic maps, we are uh, taking two remaining manifolds. They will always have the name M and N throughout this talk. The remaining metric on the domain manifold M will be called G and we will use Greek, uh, sorry, Latin indices for this remaining metric. And um, the remaining metric on the target manifold will always be abbreviated by H. And the indices we are considering here have, uh, will be Greek letters. Then we are considering a map between these two remaining manifolds, and for the moment we can just take it to be a smooth map. And we are forming an energy function by considering the Dirichlet energy for this map. And how do we do this? We take the differential of the map square root. This gives us a function on the domain manifold. And if we integrate it, we are getting a number, which is the energy of function we are looking at. And let's have a short look how this function looks uh, if we employ local coordinates. Then we see we have the vector indices and the indices of the coordinates with respect to which we differentiate. And we need the remaining metrics of both manifolds to contract these indices, which already gives you a first hint that uh, the geometry of both domain and target will have a huge influence on the behavior of harmonic maps. If you carefully inspect this energy function, then you find that there's a special dimension. Namely, if the domain manifold is two-dimensional, then this function is invariant under conformal transformations. And this additional symmetry leads to particular nice behavior of harmonic maps in two dimensions. Um, this will not be of such a great importance for this talk, but we will very often encounter conformal transformations. So it's still nevertheless good to keep in mind that dimension two is important for harmonic maps. Okay, what are now harmonic maps? They are the critical points of the energy for maps between two remaining for manifolds, and their governing equation is the following. You take the differential of the map, differentiate it once more, and as this is a geometric object, you need to use a covariant derivative on this pullback bundle to uh, calculate the second derivative and in the end, you take the trace with respect to the metric on the domain, which is G. So this object is called the tension field, and harmonic maps are precisely those maps for which their tension field is zero. Why is this called tension field? This name is coming from elasticity theory, namely in the beginning of harmonic maps. People used harmonic maps to model it in elastic material, so they thought of the domain M as rubber, for example, and if you push it, onto some other geometric object, uh, then you can calculate the tension field. And if the tension field is zero, this rubber doesn't try to rearrange itself anymore. One way of thinking of this tension field is as a Laplace operator for maps between two remaining manifolds. And if you think of the Laplace operator, you of course know that this is a linear operator, but here it's a little bit different as this is um, defined in a geometric way. Uh, the tension field is not a linear operator, so one way of seeing this is to choose local coordinates. Then you see as a leading term you have the Laplace-Beltrami operator, but there's a correction 
which involves the first derivatives squared of the map. And you see here they are contracted with the Christoffel symbols from the target manifold. So this highlights the geometric flavor of uh, harmonic maps. Even if you have never seen the harmonic map equation before, you all know the equation for geodesics, I think. And uh, if this phi would just be a curve, then this would be the second derivative of the curve. And here we would have the first derivative squared of the curve, which would be then the geodesic equation, which you all know. So what about the existence of harmonic maps? Let me show a famous existence result, which goes back to 1964 already. And this uh, theorem of Eels and Sampson uses a L2 gradient flow. So what's the idea of the L2 gradient flow? You're taking an arbitrary map, phi naught between the two remaining manifolds M and N, then you deform it by this heat type equation. So from a heat type equation, you can always expect that if you wait long enough, then this converges to some equilibrium state. And here um, it is even better, so it decreases the energy of the map phi, so that's why it's called L2 gradient flow. And you can expect that this deformation flows an arbitrary given map phi naught to a critical point of the energy function there. So that's why it's called L2 gradient flow. And the theorem of Eels and Sampson tells us that this approach works out nicely. So let's assume that M and N are closed to remaining manifolds, and we assume that the sectional curvature of the target manifold is non-positive. That's the important ingredient. Then this heat flow has a unique smooth solution for arbitrary initial data, so you can take any map. And if you wait long enough, so if you send the time to infinity, then it converges to a smooth harmonic map, and the convergence is also in C-infinity, so as nicely as you um, could hope for. Of course, you can ask if your target does not have non-positive curvature, is this result still true? And the answer is no, there something might go wrong, and this is due to the following um, result of James Eels and John Woods. So they have shown that you cannot have a harmonic map from the two torus to the two sphere, which has degree plus or minus man, regardless of the metrics on on both manifolds. So this is a topological result. It doesn't depend uh, which kind of metric you have chosen. And of course, the two-sphere clearly has positive curvature, so this doesn't contradict the existence result of Eels and Samson. Um, but this counterexample clearly shows that there may be situations in which you cannot have a harmonic map. And this is some, probably not too surprising, as I showed you on the previous slide, that the equation for harmonic maps is a nonlinear one. Okay, let me show you another result for harmonic maps, which is a unique continuation theorem that we all know from um, complex analysis, so holomorphic functions satisfy something like that, but we also have it here. So this is due to Samson from 1981. Here we need to assume that M, the domain manifold, is a connected remaining manifold, and this, we have two harmonic maps, phi1 and phi2. So if these two harmonic maps agree on an open subset, then they agree everywhere, so they are identical. And you can reformulate this a little bit. Uh, if they agree to an infinitely high order at some point, then they agree everywhere. And one special case of this unique continuation result is the following, namely if you have a harmonic map which is constant on an open subset, then it needs to be constant everywhere. The proof of this result uses the famous um, theorem of Arongine, and I will show this later uh, throughout the talk. And why do I want to emphasize that this is a nice theorem? Because it's a statement which needs a local um, assumption, but can give a global result. Usually in geometric analysis, you start the other way around. You do it the other way around. So you start with a globally defined PDE, then you multiply it with one cutoff function, do some manipulations, and you get a local uh, statement from it, like some norm is smaller on some bowel uh, compared to some other ball of bigger radius or things like that. But here it's the other way around. You only need to know something local, and then the theorem tells you something global, which is a nice thing. The first higher order generalization of harmonic maps, which I now want to have a look at, is the one which is uh, most well understood, and these are so-called biharmonic maps. So let's consider a map phi between 
very many manifolds again and now the starting point uh, for biharmonic maps is not the differential of the map but the tension field which we have already seen before and this if you take the L2 norm of the tension field and integrate over the domain manifold you're getting the so-called bi-energy um, or as we like to stress it's the in intrinsic bi-energy I will make this more precise within some minutes so the critical points of this bi-energy they are called intrinsic biharmonic maps and they are characterized by a force order PDE namely you have the tension field and on the tension field you act again with a second order differential operator namely with a connection Laplacian on this uh, vector bundle so this is a force order term and there's a second term in the biharmonic map equation which involves the curvature of the target manifold and you see here also the um, number of derivatives add up to 4 you have the differential of the map twice which is two times first order and then there's a tension field which is second order so here are also four derivatives involved and so you have a fourth order equation for maps between remaining manifolds why should you be interested in biharmonic maps so the first thing you can say is we have seen that there are instances where you cannot have harmonic maps maybe in these cases you can find biharmonic maps another thing is if you are looking for an interesting uh, scale invariant variational problem on a four-dimensional manifold then biharmonic maps um, are a promising candidate so we have seen that harmonic maps are invariant under conformal transformations on two dimensions this is no longer true for biharmonic maps, they are not invariant under conformal transformations, but they are invariant under scale transformations. So if, the, if you think of a conformal factor which is constant. Um, then they have applications in elasticity and string theory. So I already emphasized the connection of harmonic maps to elasticity and of course you could also try to minimize the tension to take this as a starting point. And if, uh, you want to do so then the bi energy might be a good measure of uh, elastic energy and this leads you to biharmonic maps and of course there's another candidate closely linked to biharmonic maps which is the Wilmer energy but there you wouldn't consider maps between two remaining manifolds but the starting point would already be an immersion which uh, is somehow a slightly different subject than biharmonic maps what you can also already see from the equation for biharmonic maps so this guy here is called the bi-tension field and you see that when you have a harmonic map which is given by the vanishing of the tension field then this is automatically biharmonic because here this would be zero this would be zero and you can also see it from the energy function because the bi-energy is zero if you have a harmonic map and uh, yeah that's why a harmonic map always solves this equation for biharmonic maps and this leads to the notion of a proper biharmonic map because what you are actually interested in is finding maps which are biharmonic and not harmonic so that's why you say uh, a non-harmonic biharmonic map is proper biharmonic so let's have a look at the local form of the biharmonic map equation and I really love this picture this is I stole this from slides from Yellen U uh, who is uh, somebody working intensively on biharmonic maps and yeah you see if you have a first look at this fourth order equation for biharmonic maps you are somehow shocked like these people in the picture and one gets used to it when so the local form of the biharmonic equation is the following of course as a leading term you have again the Laplacian squared now because it needs to be fourth order and then you have many many terms on the right hand side um, and again you see that their, their, their indices are contracted using geometric data so I've now grouped this into these um, tensors A and B and they are all linked to Christoffel symbols and their derivatives which uh, could also be rewritten in terms of Riemann curvature tensor or the derivatives of uh, the letter how you like um, and it clearly shows you that there's a geometric flavor of this equation
So um, I told you that every harmonic map is biharmonic, but uh, can we also find conditions that force biharmonic maps to be harmonic? So are there cases when um, when we don't have to look for proper biharmonic maps? And the simple application of the maximum principle already tells you if the target has non-positive curvature, then in most of the situations um, uh, biharmonic maps need to be harmonic. For example, if the domain is compact, then it's a very short calculation with the maximum principle. So if you have a biharmonic map from a compact manifold and the target has non-positive curvature, then every biharmonic map needs to be harmonic. So this was already shown by Yang, who um, was the first to calculate the first variation of the uh, bi-energy and in, in his paper where he showed the Euler-Lagrange equations he also noticed that if you have non-positive curvature then every um, proper biharmonic map is actually harmonic. But there's also something similar to the Liouville theorem for harmonic functions, namely if you have a solution of the bi-Laplace equation in flat space then uh, if your function is bounded from above and below, then it actually is also constant, which is also, also an older result. And let me show you three more uh, results of this type. So if your domain is a complete non-compact Riemannian manifold with positive Ricci curvature and the target a Riemannian manifold with non-positive sectional curvature, then by a result of BERT and collaborators, every biharmonic map with finite bi-energy must be harmonic. So this is somehow the uh, n version for a non-compact Riemannian manifold of the second result. And you can further uh, weaken the conditions that are presented in point two and three. And uh, yeah, I don't want to go in too many details here. So there are many results in this direction now explaining to you when a biharmonic map actually needs to be harmonic. Now let's come to the other way. So when do we have proper biharmonic maps? Of course, uh, I try to emphasize in the last slide when you have non-positive curvature, this will most probably not the case, but if you have positive curvature, then you can have proper biharmonic maps. So one famous example where you can check by an explicit calculation that it is a proper biharmonic map is the inverse stereographic projection. So this is going from the flat Euclidean space in four dimensions to the uh, four-dimensional Euclidean sphere. So this clearly has positive curvature, which um, suggests that positive curvature gives you proper biharmonic map. And yeah, it's nice because you can really check this by an explicit calculation. And another large class of examples of proper biharmonic maps um, was first found by these people, Cadeo, Lobo, Montaldo, Onichuch, in a series of papers. So they showed that proper biharmonic hypersurfaces of the Euclidean sphere of dimension n plus 1 are, for example, hyperspheres of uh, radius 1 over square root of 2. And you should already keep in mind that this bi corresponds to the factor square root of 2 here. That's why I made, uh, made these words here and this number in red. And there's another kind of proper biharmonic hypersurfaces, namely these are products of spheres, which both have uh, radii 1 over square root of 2, and their dimensions add up to m, but they are not allowed to be equal. So you can check explicitly um, that these are biharmonic hypersurfaces, and the conjecture is that these are really the only proper biharmonic hypersurfaces in the sphere. So this has been checked in many special cases now and there are many partial results but the final breakthrough for this conjecture is still open and there's a second conjecture going in a similar uh, having a similar flavor saying that any proper biharmonic set manifold in the Euclidean sphere is actually CMC and this is also still open and is a nice problem to work on I already um, said that so far we have considered intrinsic biharmonic maps and this suggests that there might be also a second version of biharmonic maps and actually there is. Um, and how do you formulate the second uh, version of biharmonic maps? 
So to, to write down the corresponding n energy function, you have to assume that n is embedded into some Euclidean space isometrically, so you can do this by the Nash embedding theorem. Then let's recall we have um, the intrinsic by energy, which would then correspond to the, only the tangent part of the Laplacian for this map from taking values in RQ, and you can again write this in terms of the tangent field, so this would be the, the harmonic map the biharmonic map energy that we've seen so far, but there's also now this extrinsic bi energy where you take the full Laplacian of the map that's now taking values in, uh, in a Euclidean space. So because this is now depends on how you put uh, your target manifold into some um, you, uh, in the surrounding manifold, this is called the extrinsic version of biharmonic maps, so this is the extrinsic bi-energy. Um, so this has the advantage that it is coercive, so the existence of critical points is guaranteed by um, variational methods, or you, you have many tools at hand, whereas for the intrinsic bi-energy, it's not so easy to um, derive existence results because this energy function is not coercive and you do not good, get good energy estimates if you, for example, consider a heat flow of this intrinsic by energy. But from a geometric point of view, this is a more favorable by energy because uh, it's intrinsic and doesn't depend on how you put it in some surrounding space. So if let's have a look at the most simple example we can have, namely if we have the Euclidean sphere then we can simply write down the extrinsic by energy, which, as I showed already here, is just uh, this L2 norm of the Laplacian of U, and the intrinsic by energy will be corrected by this factor here, and you can see, due to this minus sign, uh, when you, for example, would consider a heat flow, you don't get good estimates in terms of initial data, so this uh, makes this intrinsic by energy more difficult to study. But nevertheless, for a given solution, you have, for example, a nice irregularity theory available, um, but showing the existence is more difficult in the intrinsic case. Okay, after having recalled uh, biharmonic maps, let's now come to polyharmonic maps. So what would be a good uh, energy function that generalizes um, harmonic and biharmonic maps to derivatives of arbitrary order? And one idea you could have is, let's take the Laplacian and the gradient and take suitable powers of it uh, and act on the tension field. And out of this expression, we're taking the L2 norm. And this is a starting point for a map between two remaining manifolds. So that's what I did uh, here. We need to distinguish now between polyharmonic maps of even order, so if k is equal to s, we are taking this energy function, we are taking the suitable power of the connection Laplacian acting on the tension field, and the L2 norm out of this, and in the case we have an odd number, we are using the gradient ones, um, and use this expression to formulate uh, an energy function in the odd case. Again, you can see, as in the case of um, biharmonic maps, um, harmonic map will be always a critical point because um, the energy will be zero for a harmonic map, so we already know this even without knowing the euler lagrange equations. Um, but I will show you on the next slide uh, the euler lagrange equation, at least in, in for one of these functionals, and what we will see is that the critical points they are given by a semi-linear elliptic PDE, so the principal part um, comes from the Laplacian applied sufficiently often to the tension field, and then you get many lower order terms, all involving the curvature of the target manifold. So the first variation of these functions was calculated by Wang and Maeta, and here we set uh, negative powers of the Laplacian always equal to zero. And with this convention, you can, for example, write the critical points of the um, even order energy as the following. So, as I said, the leading term here is the connection Laplacian applied various times, and there are these lower order terms 
which uh, all contain the, curv contain the curvature tensor of the target. And of course, you can also do the same thing for the um, polyharmonic map energy of odd order. And uh, the equation doesn't look too different, but yeah, you can look it up in the literature if, if you're interested in the precise form. So this two, this, this tau 2s here, or tau r, is now called the r tension field, um, generalizing the notion of bi tension field. And we call the solutions of this equation of vanishing r tension field pulling harmonic maps of order r. And again, we have this issue that a harmonic map will always be a solution to the r tension field equal to zero equation, as you can also see here. So the tension field appears in every term. So if it is zero, you automatically have a solution. And that's why we again say uh, a map is called proper r harmonic if it is not harmonic. And in general, it also turns out if you have, for example, a four harmonic map, then it will not be six harmonic or eight harmonic or whatever. So um, if the numbers r and s are different, then an r harmonic map will not be s harmonic. Now let me show you a result that I obtained recently that uh, tells us when such an r harmonic map needs to be harmonic. And uh, yeah, let me explain this result. So we are starting with a complete non-compact Riemannian manifold that admits a Euclidean type Sobolev inequality. I will show you later in the next slide what this means. And let's assume that we have a polyharmonic map of even order. You can formulate the same thing for odd order as well, but uh, yeah, just for time reasons I only show you the even order case. So if the dimension um, satisfies a certain inequality, then the theorem tells you the following. Suppose that for some small epsilon uh, positive, all norms of this form are bounded. So here we have the q's covariant derivative of the differential of the map phi, and we are measuring it in this norm. And sorry, they don't need only not only need to be bounded, they only uh, need to be small for this number of indices. And the second uh, requirement is that um, these norms uh, in the L2 norm, these derivatives in the L2 norm need to be bounded up to a certain number. If these two conditions hold, then the map actually must be harmonic. So why are these uh, reasonable statements? The smallness condition, for example, is reasonable because uh, these norms are scale invariant. So if you rescale your metric, on the domain, and this is small, then this remains small, so you cannot scale this uh, requirement away. It comes out naturally, um, and hence is a natural assumption for such kind of uh, theorems. So, of course, this somehow looks a little bit weird to have uh, uh, these particular norms to be small here, but the nice thing is that it works for uh, arbitrary order of a polyharmonic map. So you can have a polyharmonic map of order 25,000 and then the theorem tells you if all the derivatives up to order so-and-so are bounded and order so-and-so are small, then this needs to be harmonic. So this is a nice thing about the theorem that it actually holds to all orders. Okay, let me tell you briefly what enters the proof. I don't want to go into the details, but uh, to just to give you the short idea, because it's a somehow very technical um, result. So you need a Euclidean type Sobolev inequality. I already mentioned that in the assumptions of the theorem. And this is the usual Sobolev inequality that you have on, um, on flat space in Rm, which is called gagliano nierenberg inequality in that case. And manifolds, which also admit such an inequality, um, are known. It's not known that not every non-compact manifold admits such an equality, but some do. And in this case, we say uh, we have a Euclidean, Euclidean type Sobolev inequality. And another thing that enters this proof is this uh, certain iteration formula. So what you need to do in the proof is to interchange covariant derivatives very often, and you will pick up curvature terms, which need to be estimated then. 
And uh, one way of doing this is using the star notation. So if you have, for example, the connection of Plasian on this vector bundle and interchange it with the R's covariant derivative applied to some vector field, then you can write it down schematically with this formula and putting all contractions into these stars. So you see here you have a certain number of derivatives of the curvature tensor. Um, you have to be careful because you ne need to differentiate the pullback connection also when uh, applying covariant derivatives uh, in a, su in a su suitable high suitable num number of high derivatives. So um, yeah, but then you can prove this formula by induction and this is really helpful in estimating the curvature terms. And uh, the rest of the proof is really technical playing, ar playing around with inequalities and please have a look at the paper if you're interested in the details. Another result which I would like to show you is the re uh, unique continuation theorems in the spirit of Samson that I showed you in the beginning. And here we need to assume that the manifold M is uh, connected. And then together with Stefano Montaldo, Cesar Unicic and Andrea Ratto, we proved the following three theorems. So let's assume we have an R harmonic map between two manifolds M and M. Um, uh, R can be bigger than three. So in, in the case R equal to two, this was already known uh, by previous work with uh, Cesar Unicic, so that's why we wrote R equal to bigger equal than three here. So if the map is harmonic on an open set U, then it is harmonic everywhere. So this is a little bit like this result from Samson where he said if a harmonic map is constant on an open subset, then it's constant everywhere. Here this result tells us if it is fully harmonic and in addition, harmonic on an open subset, then it is actually harmonic everywhere. In addition, we also have a kind of uniqueness results. So assume we have two R harmonic maps. Um, if they agree on an open subset, then they have to agree everywhere, um, which is again some local to global statement. So we are only making an uh, assumption on something um, uh, locally and we're getting a global statement. And moreover, we also have the geometric version of this re, uh, result, namely, so we're assuming we have an R harmonic map from a connected manifold into the sphere. And if this map maps an open subset of the domain into the equator, then we know that actually all of it is mapped into the equator. So how do we prove this result? The idea behind it is uh, similar to what Samson did, so we are using this Arrangine result, uh, which is quite old already, so it's from 1957, and um, but it's actually very strong result for second order elliptic equations. So here you consider a linear elliptic second order differential operator A, defined on an open subset of Euclidean space. So assume you have uh, functions in this open subset that satisfy the inequality. If you apply this linear operator to a component of u and you can estimate it by the first derivatives and the function u itself, then if you know that u is zero in an open subset, then it has to be zero throughout d. Okay, now how can we apply this Arrangine result to R harmonic maps? The R harmonic map equation is of order uh, 2R, so it's not uh, obvious how to use the result for second order equations, but there's a way uh, how to do it, and this is by uh, introducing a suitable number of recursively defined variables. So in order to do so, we are considering two R harmonic maps, which we suppose to coincide on an open subset. And then in a local chart, we define a vector valued function for the map phi as follows. So as a zero component, we are taking the map itself. As a first component, we are taking the differential. As a third component, we are taking the Laplacian of phi, then the derivative, then the Laplacian applied twice. So you see u0 is 
given over here, and so on and so on, and we stop at some point. And we do a similar thing for the other map, phi twiddle, and call this u tilde. And that's uh, some of the idea that enters the proof. Namely, after a long and straightforward calculation, you can show when we have two R harmonic maps, phi and phi tilde, and you apply the Laplacian to the difference of these u minus u tilde, then you can estimate it in a, a certain way. Of course, uh, some pages of calculations enter before you arrive at this inequality, but now you can apply the Arrangian theorem to this u minus u uh, tilde, so actually you have reduced the problem to a second order problem again. And the Arrangian theorem tells us, okay, that on this uh, open subset um, u equals u tilde, and in particular this means that also the first components have to agree, meaning that phi needs to be equal to phi tilde, which gives us the um, uniqueness result that we are we are looking for. So this is some uh, general strategy that you can follow in these higher order variational problems because you have so many tools available for second order PDEs. It's very often favorable to come up with a method to reduce your problem to a second order problem and that's actually what we did here. Now let me come to the third part of this talk uh, where I want to talk about another higher order version of harmonic maps and this goes back to Eels and Sampson and later also to Ilz and Le Maire. So the, the, this version of polyharmonic maps was first proposed by Ilz and Sampson even before they published their famous existence result for harmonic maps. And this was later taken up again by Ilz and Le Maire. Uh, so they published a, um, a book which has many nice um, uh, problems on harmonic maps. It's called Selected Topics in Harmonic Maps. Many of them are solved by now, many of them are still open. And one of these problems that they suggested is uh, problem 8.7. So this is a screenshot of their book. So they say a polyharmonic map of order k is an extremal, so it's a critical point of this functional. Um, and they say, why is this a nice problem to study? Because if your k is big enough, then this functional satisfies condition c of Pallas May. Therefore, there is a polyharmonic map of order k in every homotopy class. And this suggested the pro following problem. Study the existence of polyharmonic maps in the critical dimension m equals 2k. More precisely, what are the existence and non-existence results analogous to those for harmonic maps in dimension 2? Okay, now the first question we should ask is, are these the harmonic maps, these uh, are harmonic maps that we have seen already before, or is it something different? Okay, let me shortly rewrite this functional in order to answer this question. So as this was suggested by Eels and Sampson, let's give it a superscript ES, and that's the problem that they suggested. Here D uh, should be thought of as the exterior derivative, and D star is its L2 adjoint. So this is uh, written in terms of um, exterior algebra here. And from exterior algebra you know when you act on a function which is a zero form then d star would lower the degree by one but as this is already a zero form you cannot lower the degree so the result will be zero and also if you compute d squared and act on it um, on a function then um, this vanishes um, by the properties of the exterior derivative. In this framework of the exterior algebra, you can write the tension field as minus d star d. So this is not uh, hard to, to see. Then we obtain the following. So let's check if we uh, insert low numbers of r into this yield Sampson r energy, what do we get? So in the case of uh, r equal to 1, we're getting the usual harmonic map energy we've seen before. Okay, we know that. In the case of r equal to 2, we uh, compute the square and taking into account these rules that I showed you here, we are getting the by energy. Everything is fine too. In the case of r equals to 3, 
we're getting something which is called the tri energy but this is also captured within the framework of R harmonic maps which I showed you before so that's uh, fine too so nothing new so far but if you increase R to 4 then you find something so let's have a look here so if R is equal to 4 the E.L. Sampson 4 energy takes this form if you complete multiply out the square you're getting d squared acting on the tension field tau plus a term where you have d star t acting on tau and the other terms vanished now let's have a careful inspection of these two terms what is this this is d star acting on something which is not a function but a section in a vector bundle so you can think of tau as a zero form with values in a vector space and if you act on it with d squared this no longer vanishes because uh, it's not a, a function but it has values in some vector bundle and actually this d squared you can think of it as a two form now while the second term here you have again the, uh, the tau which is a zero form then you act with d and then with d star so the result is still a zero form in the second term in the end you have the sum of a two form and a zero form and if you form the scalar product with uh, between them so if you multiply out the square you get zero so you have these two individual contributions and of course this is something different as the four energy that I've showed you before because as I've said this d squared acting on tau this will no longer vanish uh, when tau takes values in a vector bundle so you will pick up a curvature term here and that's exactly what's written over here so this d squared tau this gives some curvature contribution from the target manifold and due to this reason this uh, yeah, polyharmonic map energy of Eels and Samson is different from the R harmonic map energy which I showed you before but you only realize that when you make R uh, at least 4 for the lower order values of R, uh, there's no difference. So this uh, led us to the following um, definition. Namely, we say that a critical point of um, this function is suggested by Eels and Samson. We call it an ESR harmonic map in order to, to highlight that it was suggested by Eels and Samson. And again, uh, we always have the problem that a harmonic map is always a solution or a critical point of this ERS R harmonic map function is. So we say it's proper if it is not harmonic. And in the case of an immersion, um, so we say that an ESR harmonic set manifold, so that is an ESR harmonic isometric immersion, it is called proper if it is not minimal. So as I said before, harmonic maps are always ESR harmonic and uh, also, if you make R really large, then you pick up more and more curvature terms in this function and it becomes extremely difficult to explicitly compute uh, the critical points of this energy. So we did it for R equals to 4, but uh, for higher values it's complicated. Okay, now let me show you some results that we could obtain about this on these ESR harmonic maps. So if you assume that r is bigger than 2 and um, the dimension is also bigger than 2 then if you consider a small hypersphere so this is a sphere of radius r immersed into some Euclidean sphere of uh, one dimension larger this is a proper ESR harmonic submanifold if and only if the radius is equal to 1 over square root of r so recall some slides earlier I showed you a corresponding result for biharmonic maps where we have seen um, this already in the case of R is equal to 2 but uh, if you replace the 2 by an arbitrary R this result still holds and this was uh, obtained in collaboration with Stefano Montaldo, Cesar Onichuch and Andrea Ratto and everything that I'm going to tell you about ESR harmonic maps is uh, in collaboration uh, with them. Another existence result we have is that of a generalized Clifford torus. So what's the idea here? 
Again, we are assuming R to be bigger or equal to 2. We are taking two numbers, P and Q, and assume that uh, we have two radii whose square sums up to 1. Then we can consider a generalized Clifford torus. So we are taking the product of two spheres, which have one of them has radii, radius R1, the other second one has radius R2, and they are immersed into some larger sphere. Then this is, uh, immersion is minimal. If these relations hold, and the case we are more interested in is that this is a proper ESR harmonic submanifold. If this case 2 does not hold, and uh, one of the two options here is supposed to hold, so if we are in the biharmonic case, that is r is equal to 2, we are getting back this result which I showed you uh, in the beginning with the product, uh, products of, of, of spheres. Um, or if r is equal bigger or equal to 3, then uh, proper ESR harmonic submanifolds in this framework are characterized as roots of the third order polynomial. And um, you can convince yourself that the certain values of P and Q and also R, there are non trivial roots of this polynomial. So there are such immersions um, if everything is properly set up. So, how do you prove the theorems? Um, I don't want to show you the details because this is a longer computation, but only give you some ideas. So first of all, one can check that this E. Sampson energy is invariant under isometries of both target and domain. And this fact allows us to apply a famous principle, namely the principle of symmetric criticality of Palais. Um, and uh, applied in this context, it tells us the following. Let M and M be two Riemannian manifolds and assume that G is a compact Lie group which acts by isometries on both M and M. Then if phi is a G-equivalent map, it is a critical point of the E. L. Sampson energy if and only if it is stationary with respect to G-equivariant variations. So what does it tell us? It tells us we can reduce the symmetry in the functional so far that there's only one dimension uh, left where we can vary something, but uh, as everything is invariant under the action of a Lie group, we do not lose something if we do this reduction in the energy functional, and it suffices to only consider variation in this one direction which we allow to be uh, flexible. So, and once we have reduced the symmetry, we can now easily determine the radii uh, in these two previous theorems and getting the existence result uh, that I showed you before. But then in the end, the uh, bad news is that actually these um, existence results that I showed you, they hold for the polyharmonic map energy and the E.L. Sampson polyharmonic map energy. So um, these curvature terms that, that there are in the E.L. Sampson energy, they are all zero for these kind of uh, of, of, of maps, so um, one could think that there might be a problem, a difference in their stability, but uh, due to the large number of derivatives, this is hard to, to compute, and uh, yeah, that's what comes out of this calculation. Another situation where we can prove the existence of critical points is when we are considering maps from the punctured disk. So let's assume we have a disk where we take out the origin and as a target we take a, a sphere which sits in the Euclidean space as usual and we are considering maps of the following form so we have some angle or some parameter alpha star and uh, multiplying with w um, divided by the norm of w and here's cosine of alpha star and then it turns out that such a map of this type is both ES4 and 4 harmonic if and only if the dimension m is uh, 8 or 9. So you can insert this answers into the equation for polyharmonic maps and you're getting an uh, algebraic equation and you see that there are only solutions if m is equal to 8 or 9. 
but this is nice because for ES4 harmonic maps 8 is the critical dimension and in this um, problems pointed out by Ilse and Lemaire they explicitly asked for pulley harmonic maps in the critical dimension and here we can give an example of a pulley harmonic map in the critical dimension. Um, yeah, but the reason why this only works in dimension 8 and 9 is probably not uh, so clear if there's some deeper reason behind it or if it's just a coincidence that uh, something we don't know. Another situation where we can get existence if we are considering a conformal diffeomorphism from the Euclidean space without the origin and, um, and uh, a cylinder as a target manifold. So then we have the following theorem. So we are considering a formal diffeomorphism defined uh, as here. This is proper ESR harmonic and R harmonic. So again, uh, these curvature terms don't play a role here, provided that uh, the dimension is equal to 2k. So again, the critical dimension. Um, and this answer doesn't lead to give something if we are in uh, odd dimension. Um, yeah, that's what just comes out of the, the calculation and you can prove this by induction on the dimension. Um, but please have a look at the paper if you're interested in the technical details. Then if you think back of um, what Ilse and Lemaire suggested in their uh, the selection on problems on harmonic maps, so they made this remark that uh, this ESR energy satisfies condition C of uh, Palais Mail, giving you an, um, the existence of a critical point in every homotopy class of maps. And he, I would like to emphasize that maybe one needs to have a closer look at this problem or something is not really understood because of this result here. So if we are taking the flat two toros, then we can explicitly compute that for a map of degree 1 with the values in the 2 sphere, the infimum of the ES4 energy vanishes. But we know that this function uh, does not a minimum, uh, does not admit a minimum in this homotopy class because of the result of Eels and Wood that I showed in the beginning. Um, so something does not really fit together here. And uh, it seems that we can also have a similar result for higher order values of R. So this may be true also for R be, uh, equal bigger to 5. So it seems that something is not really uh, well understood with condition C and ESR harmonic maps. And uh, this needs further investigation. But uh, yeah, this is really difficult to make statements here because you have many derivatives. Uh, in the last minutes of my talk, let me come to a recent result um, emphasizing a potential difference between 4-harmonic and ES4-harmonic maps. So we have seen these two higher order generalizations of harmonic maps. And uh, although the euler lagrange equations differ by curvature terms, all the explicit solutions I showed you previously, uh, they all uh, turned out to be of such a form that these additional curvature terms uh, are just zero, so there's not, doesn't seem to be a real difference. But here I can show you a result we are indicating some kind of difference. So if we are assuming that we are having a smooth four harmonic map from Euclidean space, and these energies are finite, so um, the first derivative, the basically up to the third derivative in the L2 norm are finite. Then if the dimension of the domain is 2, the map must be harmonic. And if the dimension is bigger than 2, it must be constant. If you now make the same uh, assumptions about an ES4 harmonic map and want to get uh, a similar statement, then first of all, you need to assume that the curvature of the target is bounded in the infinity norm, which is not a big change, but uh, you, you have to impose it here. But you also need to impose 
uh, a different energy to be finite to get the similar result. So I should say that this uh, result works away from the critical dimension, so m is not allowed to be equal to 8. Um, and another thing that one should say, these uh, you cannot control these additional terms here um, um, via these terms by Sobolev embedding or so. This only works in dimension 8 and away from dimension 8 these two terms are really uh, different. So the energies you need to require to be finite uh, are different and this suggests that maybe here ES4 harmonic maps and 4 harmonic maps are different. Let me give you a very short sketch of the proof. So the proof employs the uh, stress energy tensor associated to the 4 energy and the ES4 energy. The stress energy tensor is a conserved quantity and you get it because both energies are invariant under diffeomorphisms of the domain and then by Noether's uh, theorem you get a conserved quantity which here is the um, this, this tensor, so I wrote it down here only for the 4 energy and not for the ES4 energy. So for the ES4 energy you get a similar expression but even with more terms. Um, yeah, but the structure is similar. So you know that this is conserved, so this is divergence free. And what you do then, you multiply by a, a, a cutoff function and a certain combination of um, of x and norm of x and you know this is zero because uh, the divergence of the stress energy tensor vanishes then you have to do integration by parts and estimate many many terms and then you get the result after taking this limit um, of r going to infinity using the finiteness assumptions that I uh, showed you before. Okay, let me now conclude by giving an outlook. So I showed you these two extensions of harmonic maps. On the one hand, R harmonic maps. On the other hand, ESR harmonic maps. And of course, it would be nice to have a general existence theory for both of these two uh, versions of higher order harmonic maps. Can you do this by geometric or analytic methods, or do you have to find a combination of them? Then we have seen that biharmonic maps to targets with negative curvature are very often harmonic. This is also true for the higher order versions. So can you say that when you have a sphere there are many uh, non-harmonic higher order harmonic maps and in the case of a target with negative curvature there's nothing interesting. This is something interesting to explore. The stability is of course interesting to see but uh, Calculating the second variation of these higher order energy functionals is a difficult thing to do. And of course, yeah, what's the role of these curvature terms? Do they play a role or um, are they forgotten? Are they always zero on all, uh, on all the solutions we, we construct? Can we find a difference there? This would be really nice to see, but again, as you only see these forgotten curvature terms uh, for r equal to 4 for the first time, so you need to consider a PDE of order 8, which makes it very difficult uh, to come up with an explicit difference. So let me give you uh, the references of what I've told you before. So all of the results on ESR harmonic maps are in collaboration with uh, Stefano Montalvo, Cesar Nitrogen, and Andrea Ratto, and they have been published in the paper Higher Order Energy Functionals. This last result that I showed you is the result by myself, um, published recently. The structure theorem is also a result by myself, published this year, and the results on unique continuation properties, they have also been obtained in collaboration with these three people and were published recently. I would like to thank you for your attention. And I would be happy, very happy to get any kind of questions, suggestions, feedback uh, and hope to see you soon all online or even better in the real world.